Good morning. It's Tuesday, March 1st. It is actually Ohio Statehood Day. 219 years ago, the first General Assembly uh, gathered together and hence started the state of Ohio. So with that, would you please rise and join me in the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. We'll start with a prayer, please. Heavenly Father, we beseech you divine guidance in this meeting. Keep us ever mindful of our obligation. Grant us, dear Lord, wisdom, tolerance, and courage that we may well serve our county and fulfill our trust. Amen. 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 We would like to start with a moment of silence. If we'd all please rise in respect for the passage of uh, Mary Kovac, our, our relationship. Thank you. All right, we have uh, minutes. I will make a motion to approve the minutes from February 22nd. Second. Moved and second. Any discussion? Roll call, please. Swedek? Yes. Hudson? Yes. Hambly? Yes. All right, we do have a uh, proclamation to present. At the um, proclamation. Proclaiming, excuse me, March as Developmental Disabilities Awareness Month. Whereas Ohio's County Boards of Developmental Disabilities were established by the Ohio General Assembly on October 25th, 1967. And whereas the mission and purpose of the Medina County Board of DD remains as strong as ever by continuing to provide vital support and re resources to Medina County residents with developmental disabilities and their families. And whereas the almost 1,400 people with developmental disabilities served by the Medina County Board of Developmental Disabilities, their families, friends, neighbors, and co-workers encourage everyone to focus on the abilities of all people. And whereas the most effective way to increase this awareness is through everyone's active participation in community activities and the openness to learn and acknowledge each individual's contribution. And whereas Medina County encourages all citizens to foster and support such opportunities that include full access to education, housing, employment, and recreational activities. Now, therefore, be it resolved, the Board of County, Bo County, Medina County Board of Commissioners do hereby proclaim March 2022 as Developmental Disabilities Awareness Month and offer full support to efforts that assist people with disabilities to make choices that enable them to live successful lives and realize their potential. And be it further resolved, we urge all citizens to join in this celebration by spreading awareness of the many contributions offered by people with developmental disabilities in our community. Is there a motion? I will make a motion to approve. Second. Moved and second. Any discussion, comments? Roll call, please. Swedek? Yes. Hudson? Yes. Ambly? Yes. And with that, we have Stacy Malachar, our superintendent. And uh, if you want to come forward, Do we and we also have some other individuals. Consumers and so forth here, please, and you wouldn't mind introducing them. Yes. Today I've got Lena Hi. and Erin <laughs> here to um, thank you and accept this proclamation. And we certainly, you, this commissioners, you guys are tremendous supporters of us, and, and we truly support the as well as Medina County, it's just a wonderful place that really cares about people with developmental disabilities and, and opportunities that are here. So really, thank you. What is it for you? Yes. Okay. Can we hold on to that? Would you like to say Would you like to say anything? No? Thank you for everything. <laughs> now the one for our newsletter. <laughs> <laughs> I uh, would also want to open up for public mm -hmm. comments regarding any of our pending resolutions. <coughs> oh, yeah, I will, yeah. No one? You, you can stay here if you want to see more exciting stuff that we do in government. <laughs> <or> <laughs> it's also important, too. Uh, so, but feel free to go ahead. I know everybody has probably some busy days and so forth. So, but thank you so much for joining with us. All right. 
Uh, we have uh, Andy Conrad's office. Uh, Dan Becker. Dan Becker. See, it's been a long time since he's been here. I hardly yeah. recognize him. <laughs> <laughs> Andy's changed a lot. Huh? Yeah, really? Okay, yeah, yeah. We were out ripping up roads. Just so That's okay. here. <laughs> as long as you film back in. <laughs> Good morning. Good morning. Uh, we've got a couple of resolutions for your consideration. The first resolution is authorizing the Dan County engineer to buy a 2006 Ford and a 2009 Ford utility truck. Thank you for not laughing. <laughs> uh, accepting and awarding the 2002 replacement bridge uh, number two on Coons Road. Uh, resolution accepting and awarding the replacement of bridge number eight on Garber Road in Chatham Township. And a resolution approving the plan specifications and estimates for the project known as Fen Road uh, Medina County Resurfacing Project. And I'll then the weekly permits. I'll make a motion to approve the four resolutions. Second. Moved and second. Any discussion? Roll call, please. Swedek? Yes. Hudson? Yes. Hambly? Yes. One question where we're buying a 2006. All right, so tell us okay, why we're buying ahead. a 2006 <laughs> and a 2009. We, we had an unfortunate accident, and we tried to purchase a new vehicle, and as everyone, I'm sure, is you aware, you can't buy them now. Yeah. And we've got an, uh, there's a gentleman here in town, Bob Lucarelli, who had some uh, very nice vehicles from one from California, one from Georgia, and we couldn't pass it up. It was a good deal. But it looked kind of funny putting down a 2006 vehicle. <laughs> as long as it All runs. Right. <laughs> 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 if it runs, we're not going to have any more accidents. <laughs> Good. All right. Thanks, Dan. Excellent. Excellent. Thank you. <laughs> All right. Next, Jeremy Sinko, our uh, sanitary engineer. Good morning, everyone. Good morning. Good morning. Uh, four resolutions for consideration today. Uh, the first is authorizing change order number three for the solid waste district. 8730 building renovation project uh, that was to for some additional data drops that were installed roofing and sheet metal work over the canopy and to reloc relocate a jun junction box over a roll-up door and to paint the soffit so uh, the second is authorizing the sanitary engineer department to purchase a 2022 Chevy crane truck through Sourcewell I know it's not a 2006 but uh, <laughs> probably cost a little more too. <laughs> <laughs> The third is ratifying the plans and specifications for the uh, sanitary sewer main extension Ryan Road easement in Medina County uh, Sewer District number 500. The character and termini thereof, the boundaries of the assessment district and the tentative assessments thereof. And the last resolution is authorizing the sanitary engineer to proceed with the construction of the sanitary sewer main extension Ryan Road easement and authorizing the sanitary engineer to commence advertising for construction bids. I will make a motion to approve the four resolutions. Second. Moved and second. Any discussion? Roll call, please. Swedek? Yes. Hudson? Yes. Hambly? Yes. Thanks. Thank, Thank you. you. Next, Holly Murin, Human Resources Director. Good morning, Holly. Good morning. On our personal changes resolution today, we have two new hires, one in maintenance and one in sanitary, two promotions, one at Job and Family Services and one at Office for Older Adults. Seven rate increases, two at office for older adults, three in sanitary, one at county home, and one in an animal shelter, one leave of absence and commissioners, and three resignations, one at job and family services, one in maintenance, and one in sanitary. I'll make a motion to approve. Second. Move to second. Any discussion? Roll call, please. Swedek? Yes. Hudson? Yes. Hambly? Yes. Thank you. Thanks, Thank you. Thank you. All right. Next, Amy Lyon Gallo, our assistant county administrator. Good, Good morning. morning. I have nine resolutions for your consideration this morning. The first one is cash transfer for various funds. The second is the creation of the Community Housing Improvement Program Community Development Block Grant Fund for fiscal year 21 and authorizing appropriations. The third is the creation of the Community Housing Improvement Program Home Grant and authorizing appropriations. The fourth is authorizing the purchase of 6,800 gallons of regular unleaded gasoline for the engineering center. This is supports petroleum at a price of $2.6340 per gallon for regular unleaded gas. Fifth resolution is declaring Medina County property as excess property. The sixth is approving the transfer of Medina County inventory between various Medina County offices. The seventh is approving the donation of dash cameras 
rear view mirror cameras and body cameras from the Medina County Sheriff's Office to the Lawrence County Sheriff's Office. Eighth resolution is allowing expenses of county officials. And the ninth is approving claims for the week in the amount of $605,987.67. I'll make a motion to approve the nine resolutions. Second. Moved and second. Any discussions? Roll call, please. Swedek? Yes. Hudson? Yes. Hambly? Yes. Thank you. Very good. Thank you. Thanks, Amy. All right. Uh, next department updates, Denise Testa. Good morning. Good morning, Good morning Denise. Okay, so for, as you know, for February, we did not have a planning commission meeting for March. We have uh, four major subdivisions, two in Hinkley, one in Montville, one in uh, Liverpool. We also are reviewing a concept plan that has been submitted for our March meeting as well. And then we're also um, considering CRA uh, nominations as well for April mm -hmm. so which we will I'm sure have warmer weather um, we have uh, two major subdivisions one in Medina one in Liverpool and then we also have a Guilford Township text amendment um, as we discussed a couple of months ago the Senate bill 52 resolution regarding wind and solar energy declaring townships as exclusionary zones was uh, recorded last week so it is now official um, we met for the first time with our subdivision regulations work group last week um, and I really appreciate uh, those individuals that have volunteered for a 12-month commitment. Um, our themes that we talked about were essentially um, creating some subdivision flow charts and processes, um, revising our application so that individuals or applicants can submit them online as well as potentially payments online. Um, website improvements, subdivision uh, regulation document, organization, and design, um, as well as uh, considering some language edits. Um, so our next meeting is uh, next uh, month, the last Wednesday of the <coughs> month, and we will be reviewing articles one, two, and three. So I will keep you updated on how that is coming. I'll, I'll point out, Denise had it very oh. well organized. It was a oh, an organizational group, but the, the, the workflow is really well very well organized and as each section is reviewed and recommendations come out, those are going to be sent out for review by other entities, right. uh, townships and so forth, correct. get some input and uh, meanwhile the committee will continue working monthly. So Correct. So we will receive um, intermittent feedback um, each month. Um, so we also um, are working with ODOT uh, in order to schedule the week of March 21st to discuss the Sharon Township Township conceptual okay. access plan on State Route 90, and that State Route 94 corridor, corridor, which is south of Fixler, north of uh, City of Wadsworth, as we've had five subdivisions come through for review for that. So um, we will um, invite township residents, trustees, uh, zoning commission, as well as ODOT and myself will be there, as well as some of the parcel owners. We're inviting them as well. Um, so our electric vehicle charging stations um, we were officially approved for two L2 ports so um, these will be located in our um, parking lot uh, we've looked at several locations in the parking lot that hasn't been confirmed just yet and thank you to Stephen for helping us out with that um, for March they are finalizing the costs the program specs as well as sending out the request for bids for that and that is through no these app, are not right? the fast charging these are the ones right. that take about an hour about an hour to charge that's up. right yeah. That's right. Um, so our chip application is officially online on our website. Um, we did review and revamp our application. Uh, the Planning Services Office will serve as the liaison to our Medina County communities. We are open from 8 to 4.30. Um, and we will uh, hand out applications as well as accept applications in our office during business hours. And of course we so, can. So Denise. Go ahead, I'm sorry. What does chip stand for? The Community Housing Improvement Program, I'm sorry. Okay, who can apply? Uh, anyone in Medina County and Wadsworth, uh, those city of Wadsworth, we are partnering with them. Mm -hmm. Okay. I'm sorry. Thank you. <laughs> just so everybody else understands. I'm just excited for this new application <laughs> right. process. I can't, um, I can't uh, wait to, to continue working with our county residents and really providing them with a, a quality mm -hmm. service but and it also accessible. Eligible, correct. It is right. income eligible, correct. But for questions, they can call me or 
sure. um, call my office or also call the uh, Wadsworth City Office, which is the Building and Planning Department with Jeff Kaiser. Um, we're continuing to uh, uh, work on our CDBG uh, projects in our, our various uh, uh, communities, including the critical infrastructure in Lafayette. So uh, Nils Johnson at Cunningham and Associates is completing his uh, part of the process and that those are um, continuing to move forward. Sure. Are there any questions? How many townships um, have indicated they're going to update their zoning? Have you oh, had any discussions with them? This yes, way? and, and we, I, we, I, I know I reported that fund. I That's know right. I reported yeah. out in the one meeting, um, and I want to say it was close to between sixty and seventy percent. Good. Uh, I mean, it was a good number. Okay. Um, and and I can't. I mean, I'm taking this off the top of my head, so I know this is going to be in the minutes. So if I'm not accurate, you know, don't <laughs> get, more, more don't get half, upset. More than half the township. Okay, that's a good way to put it. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Close so, enough. So Close a enough. little trivia. Yeah. How many townships are there in Medina County? Oh, he already did. 17. 17. Actually, there's 18. 18. Oh, okay. You're talking about the paper townships. The Wadsworth townships. Wadsworth townships. Yes. yes. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So, so back yeah, yeah, in yeah. the '70s, the state required the city of Wadsworth, as it was configured at that time to actually be in a township. So they created Pardee Township yeah. for the city of Wadsworth. Yeah, now, right. Wadsworth has since expanded beyond the bounds of that and yeah. has consumed that township, but there are actually 18. Yeah, you're right, you're, you're right, you're correct. Oh yeah, yeah. It's a, it's All right. But it's considered a paid Sorry. township. Yeah. <laughs> it is well, indeed. I have to say, we did not include that in the county uh, zoning township-wide right. well, map. So well, they don't have elected that. trustees, so. They, yeah. they do not. <laughs> All right, thank you. Thanks, Denise. Thank you. <laughs> It's a good trivia question. I, 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 just, that I found there. that out. Uh, Cesar yeah. Carino wrote an article for yes. the Historical yes, Society. He yes, he did. Yes, he did. As he well knows. Yes. All right. He's got like at least two or three books on, on Wadsworth <laughs> history, so he's, he's, he's the expert there. Uh, with Laura Toth, Office for Older Adults. Good morning. Good morning, Good morning. Laura. Um, following up on what Denise was saying, we're going to have her come and talk to a staff about um, CHIP grants and how we can help promote those to seniors who might be in need in the county. So um, hopefully she'll be able to come in the next couple months. <laughs> um, we've had a really good month. Uh, topped off with the Brunswick Senior Expo, which did take place on Friday, February 18th, during the second of the two Friday ice storms. <laughs> um, we had about 50, set, uh, 50 vendors who braved the snow and ice that Friday um, to set up. And we had about 120 seniors who attended. Um, while that's less than half of a typical uh, large-scale event in Brunswick, we had a wonderful time. It was really the first big event since COVID. The vendors had not seen each other out and about. The seniors got all this one-on-one -on -one attention. It was just a really um, fun time. Um, I think it was really like the perfect event to get us back into the swing of things and ready for uh, Senior Day. Uh, which is in May uh, at the at the Medina County Fairgrounds. So that's our uh, next large event. We also had several staff who hadn't been through one of these uh, kind of great events, so it was nice to uh, get them uh, on board too. So how things run. So a good time. Um, our January service report. Uh, we we served 3,451 home delivered meals um, to 189 clients, which is a solid number and probably. Um, about where we will stay for this year. I think we'll stay in the 180s as far as cli uh, clients. That's above where we were pre-pandemic. We would run about 140, um, but I think everything we were delivering to about 250. Mm -hmm. So it's kind of come down and stayed um, in the in the 180s. Um, last year, uh, like I said, we served this year, we served 3,400. Last year, we served 5,035. So um, to 268 cli clients. So it was really up. That was the height of things back in uh, January uh, 2021. Um, transportation units remain low. Uh, we paid for 487 transit rides. Um, the pre-pandemic, we were in the mid-600s. So we, we are fighting to get that transit number um, back up. Um, Shannon and I have talked, um, and uh, we're going to work with Medina County Public Transit, try and figure out ways where we can uh, Bill, uh, the loop rides, which now uh, we pay for in bulk. We'd like to separate those out and bill individually. We, we, we are, it's allowable under our grant. We just have to figure out a way to do it because as people come in right now, their names, when they check in for the loop, their names aren't being taken. 
that's taken. So how can we make that work? Try to figure it out. So hopefully I have something exciting uh, to say on that. Um, I want to talk a little bit about Friday night. Um, it was uh, great. I got to see the Medina County Home Superintendent, Greg Brown, dance at Faith in Action's <laughs> Dancing with the Stars. I know a couple of the commissioners uh, were there. As I told you last month, uh, Faith in Action is turning over all their services to Office for Older Adults. That's already happened. The volunteers are adapting to uh, a new coordinator in just a slightly different way of doing things. Um, and I'm happy to say that clients who were active under Faith in Action, it was seamless. They just continue to get the services um, from volunteers, get the transportation that they need, and they haven't had any interruption. Um, at the event last Friday, I revealed our new program name, which keeps the spirit of what Faith in Action is all about. So our volunteer homemaker services will be called Compassion in Action. So I brought the logo. Now, who the designed logo. the logo? Um, Joanne Menke who is our activity yep. and media supervisor, yeah, and it really goes very along very well with our Office nice. for Older Adults logo. I wanted it to fit with that, so mm -hmm. it has the same color scheme. This is much easier to reveal. Friday night I was holding a microphone and I had this, and it was very <laughs> awkward, so. <laughs> <laughs> it's nice to do it at a podium, but I wanted yeah. to you know, make, news and make use of this, and I'll show you guys again. So, thank you. All right. That's all I have. Any questions? Yeah. Yeah. Friday was wonderful. It oh, was, yeah, it, it was, was a great awesome. time. Thank yeah. you. Yeah. Thanks so Thanks, much. Laura. Thank you. So next year the event is going to go on yeah. as planned, correct? Correct. And, and it'll be run The benefits by our will go to Compassion in Action with, the, with mm -hmm. our foundation. Correct. Super. Yes. Thank you. So, and you are looking for volunteers yes, to sign up for Dancing dance, with the Stars. Just want to point out. Don't <laughs> everybody raise <laughs> their hand. Yeah. Stan, Stan, and, you're, Stan, you're retired now. You have time. They, <laughs> they do give you free dance lessons for at least uh, a couple months' it's worth. It's fun. So, I yeah, did it the first year that they ever had it. I, uh, I danced, though, and now right. I've done it. I don't know. You might be approached, so be willing to try. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Laura. Uh, OSU Extension, Sierra Baca. Good morning. Good morning. Well, like they said, my name is Sierra Baca. I'm um, the 4-H educator at the Ohio State University Medina County Extension Office. Um, so first, we'd like to talk about a couple of statewide initiatives. Um, first, the avian flu, which, was, which is a pathogenic avian bird flu in the USA. So far, we have not had any reported cases in Ohio. The poultry specialist at Ohio State University is sending us the most current information as it comes out. All 4-H market exhibitors, like poultry, take a yearly quality assurance class where they learn, where they're educated on things like biosecurity, which will help them keep their birds safe for this year. The state vet and the poultry specialist at OSU are creating short vid videos to educate the public on this topic. If you have any concerns about your bird's health, please contact your vet. Um, we will continue to push out the most current information. Next, we'd like to talk about the spotted, lan spotted lantern fly, and Ms. Ashley has um, some examples for you guys to see. Use those to educate the public. These aren't live, are they? <laughs> <laughs> they were, but not anymore. <laughs> given, the, given the pins in them, I say no. <laughs> oh. um, so they are an invasive oh, okay. insect in Ohio. It is not currently reported in Medina County. Please oh. be on the lookout for this insect because it is a pest to grapes, hops, woody trees, and shrubs. Ashley, our ag and natural resource educator, is planning workshops to educate the public on this insect. Um, if you think you've found a spotted lanternfly, please contact the Ohio Department of Ag or our extension office with a photo or a captured sample. Um, and there's one more. When are they likely to, to, to come out? So right now they're um, overwintering as eggs. You'll right. we'll start to see them in May, June if we have um, some of the nymphs hatching in the area. We know there's two uh, reproducing populations in Cleveland and right. there's one suspected population in Lorraine. So we are Keeping an eye out. Ooh, kind of okay. Right. Even though they're invasive, they, they are pretty. I know. <laughs> <laughs> the same way. They're very pretty. Uh, how long do they live? Well, they have a one year life cycle, um, but they do survive our winters. Hmm. Um, so, next, I'm just going to give some general extension updates. Um, Kyle White, our community development educator, will be presenting Government Academy April 9th at the Blair Center, which you are all invited to. Um, this year's focus is collaboration. There will be a workshop presented by Zach Space and Jim Renazzi on political basics. The keynote speaker will speak on community re revitalization. To RCP, please visit Leadership Medina County, 
website, um, and we provided you guys some information on the handout. 4-H enrollment is currently open and will close April 15th. Um, we allow summer enrollment until the end of May. Um, so that's just one project instead of the 10 that you can take regularly. Um, if you're interested and know anyone interested, please have them contact our office and we will connect them with the community club. Um, in 4-H for 2022, we're also interested in partnering with our schools, the libraries, and the parks um, to reach more youth with our programs like Health Rocks, um, a STEM program, and some leadership training. Um, I also provided you a menu we will be giving to the schools, libraries, and parks of what we can offer through 4-H. Our FCS educator, Family and Consumer Sciences, Erin uh, Ruggiero, is currently partnering with schools on a project called Real Money, Real World. Um, and that's another thing highlighted in our school menu for you guys. Um, as an office, we have restarted the extension advisory um, and welcome feedback from, for our programs from community members of that group. And finally, we are excited to bring back Ag Day for 2022. Um, mark your calendars for September 23rd, uh, and we will present more information on this the next time we're all together. All right. Yeah. Very good. Any, Thank you. Yeah. Any questions? Thank you so much. Uh, next, Shannon Ryan, our transit director. I think you have some resolution, resolution for us. One resolution well. for your yeah. consideration. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning, Shannon. I was absent last week. I was traveling, but thank you for allowing me to join this week. Um, sure. We have one resolution for your consideration. It's uh, transit services agreements with uh, Community Action, Wayne and Medina. I met with their new mobility uh, manager, Janet Conrad, who was very excited about transit. She visited our building, gave a a uh, good overview of what we do, so we want to make sure that we can continue services to them, and this allows us to do that. I'll make a motion to approve. Second. Moved and second. Any discussion? Roll call, please. Swedek? Yes. Hudson? Yes. Hambly? Yes. Thanks for the collaboration. Oh, yeah. It's good. Indeed. Uh, very knowledgeable and very helpful partner, and uh, we're great to have her with us. Um, join us. Uh, to go over our performance indicators and for the month of January, just looking at where we're at, um, you know, fixed route ridership is down so far this year. I fully expect it to go up as the warmer weather comes. Mm -hmm. um, also, March 18th is an, impor um, an important date for the Federal Transit Administration with the mask mandates. We feel uh, that could pass um, and go and we could be masked not have to have mass on the buses. We're still doing that till that date. I heard the CDC on Friday alleviated that. Did they not? Uh, not for public not transportation. For public transit, for they schools. did for school buses. They did yeah, for, for school, school buses. but not, not for public, public transit. Uh, that's, yeah. That is correct. Yeah. 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 All right. Hopefully. Um, demand ridership was uh, pretty steady. We're seeing, still considering, continuing to see ridership uh, growth there. We did have some trip denials, just a capacity issue based on our current service, and we're going to respond to that. Um, I don't like trip denials. I like to get people where they need to go, but it does happen. It is happening a little bit more than I'd like to see, so we're continuing to respond to that. Um, we're seeing an in -trip, uh, increase in trip cancellations, less, less late cancellations. That's less than two hours, so we're doing a lot more to educate our passengers on the need to schedule when needed, but cancel, leaving some capacity, which will help some of those uh, issues with trip denials possibly. So an education is very important by our uh, and I just want to take an opportunity, our team, my team, our team, has done a really good job of getting through the, the, the difficult weather, um, the challenges of the pandemic. Um, we've got a really good group and uh, we were happy to provide that service. Got a lot of passion with the team, so, and the drivers do a really, really great job. Uh, they love the customers and love the passengers. It's very important to us. So, um, overall ridership is steady at this time, again, Seeing as we come out of the weather, we should improve there. Um, we did uh, see an increase in job and family services out of county transit. We bumped up from four buses to out of county transportation. Uh, just demand, just demand mm -hmm. to go to Cleveland for differences, Cuyahoga County specifically, and the summit as well. So that bumped mm -hmm. up to four this last month, and I, I think I met with uh, Ace Taxi at their office and worked on uh, an extension to extend services for another year as part of our contractual agreement with them. Mm -hmm. And uh, that'll give us a chance to evaluate how we're doing with the RFP. Any change in the rates? No, stayed the same. Stayed the same? Stayed okay. the same. I met with their, their owner and their board president. And their Do president they have a, a, a fuel surcharge? No. 
didn't have any increase. I looked at what they're making and monitored and shared with them. I'm aware of what your profit margin is. I mean, we're very comfortable with it you know, okay. so far. Good. So we're looking at what we do next year with, as you mentioned, the price of fuel. Um, could be challenging. Mm -hmm. Indeed. We've met some of the, the needs so far, but we're really turning that close. Okay, okay good. Um, I mentioned the community action uh, mobility manager. She's going to be also, Dan's going to be joining the, we had our first steering committee of the strategic planning on February 10th. Mm -hmm. um, Steve, thank you for attending. Sure. Um, you know, we went over everything from what the role of the steering committee is to the project timelines, to applicable data of the county, and really what the transit need is. This group is very plugged into what we're doing. I think um, we've got the right folks in the room, and that's very important to the process. Um, so we're going to continue to grow our group, with this, but have the steering committee remain focused to the ambassadors of the process and the program. Um, it, it, I want it to happen really soon. So I will mm -hmm. continue to drive that process to make sure Amy's been very supportive of making sure that we have the resources we need, and I'm very thankful for that. Um, really exciting time for transit to figure out how we move forward with transit for the next five to ten years. Um, I'll mention one other thing. I uh, traveled, I mentioned, like I said, I was out of town. I went to a transit bus summit, which is uh, ultimately an opportunity to see different vendors and how they're doing things, along with other transits. There was 50 other transits there, CEOs, uh, maintenance directors. Um, got to see some electric vehicles. Um, what I found was, and I didn't know something, that I, you would think that heat in the south is tougher on an electric battery, but actually it's the cold. Mm -hmm. um, they're talking about some heating mechanisms, diesel heating mechanisms. There was a lot of focus on 35 and 40 foot vehicles right now. Um, many of the vendors are trying to get that way first. They feel that's the best cost effective way to impact the overall industry and the FDA is focusing on that. But, you know, they did look at a 28 foot type of vehicle. Um, I think battery capacity has a lot to do with it. Mm -hmm. uh, they're talking about putting the batteries on the roof, on the mm -hmm. bottom, mm -hmm. or in the back. And that seems to be what the engineers are trying to figure out the best way. In mm -hmm. the back is kind of a safety issue. Uh, down below seems to be the best because that's the most heavy and the top doesn't seem to be as popular. I mean, um, the battery capacity, um, you know, generally is affected by the weight of the vehicle and the size of how many passengers are on board. Um, about 140, 145 miles is what they're talking about per charge. That could be a challenge to the larger industry. So, but us, that actually would work if we could get it in the size vehicle we want. So I'll watch for. So, so our vehicles are not 35 and 40 foot long. Mm -hmm. They're they're mm -hmm. smaller, right? Smaller, smaller, Much yeah. smaller. Yeah. smaller. So. We're, 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 either, we're, we're in line for some new advances in uh, the electric. I'm very interested in it. I learned that the major barriers, obviously, are the vehicle getting the productions up and running, but it's also the maintenance of them, high-cost maintenance. Technicians, mm -hmm. um, especially trained, especially trained. Um, uh, there's still tires. There's still belts. There's still a you know, cooling system in it, but there's some things and it's mainly a lot of warranty work, so you have to find a close vendor that can help you with that. Uh, I think that's my next stop, is to see how everybody else is doing it, find out what works, what's not worked for them, and stay close to uh, the state contract when it comes out. Are that's there what I any manufacturers in Ohio? I haven't seen any. Yeah. Um, New York, uh, Pennsylvania's trying really yeah. hard. Um, the Chicago area is ordering buses, but I talked to one gentleman in Rhode Island and he doesn't have anybody to fix the buses that he has. <laughs> Finding a technician to fix yeah. one of those buses is not like uh, mm -hmm. finding a diesel. So do you think the transit garage itself has the infrastructure capable of handling multiple chargers? I mean, I'm assuming you'd run them the all electric, day. Right, yeah, and then, and the then capacity, you, you, yeah. you could have potentially a number of buses recharging at night. Like all of them. But yeah. Yeah, <laughs> there, would, all electric. Electric. there yeah. would need to be a charging uh, station at our as our trans mm -hmm. right, center, right? And also what, at the garage. I, just, I guess the question is whether we have sufficient capacity there. What kind of electrical upgrades will have to be built into it? To, to and working that. with Ohio Edison, our supplier, on that. Haven't had those conversations yeah. yet. Yeah. Uh, the, the, I guess the is it chicken and the egg? Do you get the buses right. and then get the facility? I think you need the facility. Right. You need right. both, right? Frankly, yeah. I, I think the approach to is kind of waiting out to the first wave of development occurs and holding out as long as we can 
with our s current systems and then getting kind of the second generation That's correct, of those. I believe that. that way uh, it optimizes and the second the, generation might yeah, be more it, cost be, effective. It'd be cheaper and obviously uh, the maintenance issues will have hopefully been worked out. I agree. It's, it's, you don't want to be the alpha, you want to be the beta. Right. You don't want to yeah. be in that line where you're testing. But there's a lot of proven technology out. Proterra was a company that builds right. a fiberglass yeah. bus, not steel at all. Right. Very, um, very sure. lightweight, very mm -hmm. uh, composite that doesn't rust, which excited me. Right. Um, and we gave them a lot of insight. They listened to us a lot at this mm -hmm. conference of what we need. So I've got three or four contacts to keep to keep going on with one of those different things. But Steven will, fig Steven will figure it out, right? Yeah. I, I looked at <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, I told you. I looked at Steven only, but we have not, I, in all honesty, we have not had that conversation. I think it's about time that we have what we would do if we could, right? All right. All right. Step in front of him, the busy All right. guy. All right, thank you. Indeed. Thank you, Jen. Thank you so much. Take care. All right. Uh, we, we do have a resolution uh, proclaiming March 6th through 12th, 2022 as w Women in Construction Week, whereas the National Association of Women in Construction, Chapter 156, has distinguished itself for 45 years as the voice of women in construction in Medina County. And whereas the work done by Chapter 156 has benefited Medina County through community development and educational programs, and the support of its member membership who participate in quality construction practices benefiting Redwood neighbors throughout Medina County and whereas the construction community represented by Chapter 156 and Redwood Living Inc. has been a driving force in fostering community development through the construction of Redwood neighbors, neighborhoods, promotion of skilled trades, careers, and a positive vision of the construction future of Medina County and whereas Redwood Living Inc. operates nine apartment neighborhoods in Medina County with two currently under construction. Those nine locations are comprised of 1,005 single-story apartment homes and 15 Medina County-based employees. And whereas Chapter 156 has sought to achieve successful results for Medina County in a cooperative spirit with other organizations. Now, therefore, be it resolved, the Medina County Board of Commissioners do hereby recognize the National Association of Women in Construction, Chapter 156, and its many dedicated volunteers for its steadfast work on behalf and support of women in construction, and do proudly proclaim the week of March 6 through 12, 2022, as Women in Construction Week, and encourage our citizens to congratulate the organization on its many accomplishments. I'll make a motion to approve. Second. Moved and second. Any discussion? Yes, there are a number of uh, women who work in the construction industry in Medina County, and this is uh, to recognize all of them for their diligent work. Indeed. Roll call, please. Swedek? Yes. Hudson? Yes. Campbell? Yes. Uh, we do have a resolution appointing and reappointing members of the Medina County Advisory Council on, on uh, Aging and uh, Disability. Um, the, uh, where it comes to the attention of Medina County, the Board of Commissioners, that there is a vacancy on the Medina County Advisory Council on Aging and Disability for a Medina County Township Trustee Association member number one representative, whereas Rick Monroe has expressed interest in serving on said board as Medina County Township Trustee Association member number one, whereas it also come to the attention of the Commissioners that the term of Kimberly Coring Weinman uh, at large member number five will expire March 31st, 2022. And whereas Kimberly Curing Weinman has expressed an interest in continuing to serve as at large member number five. Now, therefore, be it resolved by the Board of Commissioners of Medina County, Ohio, that Rick Monroe is hereby appointed to the Medina County Advisory Council on Aging and Disability as Medina County Township Trustee Association representative with his term expiring September 30th, 2024. Be it further resolved by the Board of Commissioners of Medina County, Ohio, that Kimberly Curing Weinman is hereby reappointed to the Medina County Advisory Council on Aging and Disability as an at-large member with her term expiring March 31st, 2025. I'll make a motion to approve. Second. Moving to second. Um, any discussion? Just want to say thank them both. These are volunteer positions, very important in terms of enlightening and, and providing insight to uh, our various uh, uh, programs and re reaching out for those that uh, are in need of those services. So I want to thank them. Roll call, please. Swedek? Yes. Hudson? Yes. Campbell? Yes. We do have a notice of a liquor permit filing, uh, that this is a transfer from Ohio Springs Incorporated doing business as Sheet 741 located on 8480 Willow Road, Harrisville Township, Burbank, Ohio, for a C1, C2 permit class. This is just for notification. All right. Uh, now, uh, open to public comment. Anyone? Okay. Now we'll 
discussion. All right, this point, uh, Sheriff, do you have something for us? That's why you're standing back there, right? Yeah, yeah you're standing <laughs> up there. Get you. Matt, you. Yeah, sure. sure. Oh, yeah, please. Yep. Good morning. Good morning. Um, as you may or may not know, uh, Matt Esterly here is the Chief Probation Officer at the Dining Municipal Court. And we have uh, vehicles that are we're going to be auctioned off. Uh, Matt approached us about donating one to his program, which is an uh, extremely valuable program to the county. It's mm -hmm. the Valor Court, uh, Veterans Court. And we've done this collaboration before, as you know, the commissioner is donating the vehicle to the career center Recent. for that uh, worthwhile program. So mm -hmm. I'm going to let Matt talk about his program because he knows more about it than I do. So okay. Thank you, Sheriff Greg. Thank you very much. You yeah, sure. Thank you very much. Good morning, folks. Uh, my name is Matt Esterly, and I'm the chief probation officer with the city of Medina, the Medina Municipal Court. Uh, I started with the city of Medina in late 2019, and part of my duties uh, when I was hired here by Judge Werner was to establish a valor court with uh, Judge Werner's guidance. We have done that. We recently received Supreme Court certification to operate for the next three years as a specialized docket. Um, for those of you who do not know what valor court is, is valor court is a specialized docket that's dedicated uh, to defendants with military experience that find themselves in the criminal justice system. It was established recognizing that many of our veterans return to civilian life with serious physical and mental trauma. Too often, these conditions lead to their involvement with the criminal justice system. Valor Court provides an evidence-based alternative to traditional sentencing methods. Using a non-adversarial approach to addressing criminal offenses, it is structured to assist the veterans with access to programs, treatment, interaction with mentors, and a collaborative initiative to enhance their chances of sustained success. The rewards and sanctions are designated to incentivize rehabilitation, to anticipate and deter relapse, and to restore participants to functional decision making and relationships. Uh, the Valor Court is supervised by an advisory committee of community stakeholders and is operated by volunteers from the court, relevant government agencies, and the community. So what I approached Sheriff Christ was about is that we at the municipal court, we only have one service vehicle and typically that vehicle is usually checked out every morning to serve papers, uh, evictions, bond and, and bail verification. So we find it en enormously difficult to be able to conduct home visits and field visits with our defendants, especially important in the day and age of the pandemic and COVID. So we need to meet defendants where they're at in the community rather than having them come into a, an already overcrowded building. We're small on space and it just seemed prudent that we needed to meet more of them in the community. Best practice will tell you that if you visit with any probationer times within the first 90 days, you increase their chances of success by almost double. So being a true countywide initiative, several of which are on our advisory board, I approached Sheriff Rice and I said, listen, I said, I need a vehicle. I said, I need to be out and checking on these folks. It increases community safety, which is our number one role in, in the probation field to make sure we're doing the best we can to keep our community safe. But one of the benefits of is that we can take folks out of the jail, say Sheriff Rice space to put the, the more scary and predatory offenders and those that we can treat, we can treat in the community and probation. So. I do appreciate the donation, Sheriff. Hopefully it goes through. So, and I appreciate the time to speak today. Thank you very much. Right. Thanks, Matt. Yeah. Yeah. Any I questions about anything? I would just like to add, obviously this is a tremendous program for those individuals that have given so much to us, not only our county, but our country. And I think it was well done by you and the judge to, to come up with such a unique program. So good job. Sure. I am on the Citizens Committee for Advisory the board. The Citizens Advisory Board for the Valor Court, so I am honored to support this um, donation. Thank you very much. Indeed. It, it's, uh, it's just part of the collaboration we have. You know, Medina City is our mm -hmm. resident um, city, so uh, we, we need to support them, and this is a, a good thing not only for Medina City, but for the entire territory that the court serves and for Medina County, so got my vote. Thank you very Indeed. much. Indeed. Yeah. We would extend an uh, party invitation to anybody who would like to come and observe the Valor Court. Um, we have two components. We have a treatment team meeting. It starts at 1.30. It's uh, every other Tuesday. Our next session will be on March the 8th. And then at 2 o'clock is when the actual court session is held. So if you'd like to come observe firsthand uh, how we're doing, we have five active uh, participants right now. Our carrying capacity is anywhere from 12 to 15 veterans. And what we're trying to target, folks, is their highest risk and highest need defendants who are you know, at the most chances of, of recidivism. 
don't fool too much with the lower risk offenders and stuff. A lot of times you see involvement and the court changes their direction and their path in life and stuff. But the ones that are repeat offenders on a target so that we get the, the intervention going as early, as early as we can. And again, it's a benefit to the county because we're removing folks out of the jail system and putting them back in the community, back in with their systems and their families and stuff. So. Mm -hmm. Very good. Excellent. Thank you. My right, thanks to good. you and to Thank you. Judge Warner. Yeah, Judge Warner. Yep. Great vision to put this together. Oh, yeah. 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 Absolutely. Yeah. Thank you very much. Thank good. you. Super. You have anything else for a sheriff? Uh, just another donation. Uh, Scott and have been very helpful. As you know, the board helped us out with the body cams and the dash cams for the cruisers. Mm -hmm. So the old technology we're going to donate to Lawrence County Sheriff's Office, which is the southernmost uh, county in the state of Ohio. Mm -hmm. Population roughly 59,000, so it's an agency in need. Uh, I think, Amy, we figured out the value of everything is roughly $4,600. So mm -hmm. it's better to put good use of under agency. So, so we'll put that on resolution on next week. We, we, we've already Just passed it. It was already oh, on here today. Well, we'll Fantastic. See. Yeah. For so next Tuesday for the vehicle. So yeah. got it. It's ready. All right. Thank you very much. Thank you so Thanks, much. Sheriff. Thanks for being here. All right. Good, good. Uh, next, actually, I, I might skip SIPOs uh, over. Excuse me. Our Housing uh, Network's Emergency Shelter Project. Um, as you know, we had a presentation a couple weeks ago regarding the coordinated community plan um, and that uh, one of the components of that involves a construction of a uh, recommendation for an emergency shelter. Um, and at this point, uh, we're approaching a deadline for, uh, for funding, uh, hopefully asking the state with the state capital uh, grant program for funding for that. And Skip, did you want to... Um, and Skip and I have been working together on trying to uh, put together the packet of information we're looking at the end of this week to have everything finalized and obviously the, uh, the idea of the, the commissioners being able to sign the letter and support and, and uh, be the uh, fiscal agent uh, for the rece receipt of those funds should we be awarded that. So Skip, did you want, you also have shares with some design stuff hey, on this. You took my intro. Sorry. Um, no. <laughs> <laughs> Go ahead. Um, hey. Well, anyway, good morning, Commissioners. Thank morning. you, Steve, for the introduction. Um, I'll skip right to the recap. Two weeks ago, I was asked uh, to come back with a concept and some numbers um, so that we could present the concept, one of the legs of the emergency housing uh, community plan that we put together, the coordinated community plan to prevent and end homelessness. Um, here I am. So at your place, you have a small packet. Uh, it includes two different things. One is a site plan. The other is a floor plan. Um, the site plan is basically a generic site plan that can be adapted to any site. No particular site has been selected at this time. Um, it provides for all of the current best practices in the industry. Um, pretty straightforward in that regard. The floor plan is very comprehensive, and it also is based on industry standards. It includes office space for staff, um, approximately 30 beds, but it's flexible space, so it can be used for more if we need it. Um, it can provide privacy when smaller populations are housed. Um, other spaces are in that development as well, including common areas, laundry facilities, and the like. Uh, you'll even notice there's a pet area. One of the things that I've learned in this business, um, especially when we completed the Menwa project in Wadsworth a few years ago. People choose to live in vehicles if they can't find housing that will accept a pet. Um, and so as a dog lover, um, I will tell you that uh, knowing that that's an industry best practice, I thought that was great. That's a concept that's included in there. The design was conceived in conjunction not only with the consultant that we retained, Tom Albanese, um, but also TC Architects. TC Architects has designed many buildings for the Housing Authority but also for the Adam Board and what's known now as the Society, formerly the Society for Handicapped Citizens, or SHC. Um, uh, TC's recent work was the Recovery House on Northland Drive in conjunction with the Adam Board. Um, they've done group homes for the Society throughout the county and our recently completed Santee Landing on Seville Road. That was a TC design. Um, and they recently completed design work for a shelter comparable uh, in Portage County, so they're well versed in this area. From a budgetary standpoint, we estimate the capital cost of $2.1 million. This will provide for the development of the building to equip it and to furnish it. Um, operating costs we're still working on, but the preliminary plan from my perspective right now would be to relocate housing authority staff, our case managers who work with folks with emergency housing needs, 
to this location, um, my expectation is that we would probably retain the services of a, uh, an experienced shelter operator, but it would be overseen by the authority, so it's done in, in county. I want to bring an outside entity in who's not familiar with our um, infrastructure, if you will. So I think that right now is the best uh, approach that we'll have. The Ohio Department, um, Ohio Development Services Agency, ODSA, part of the Department of D Development, provides some of our funding for emergency programs now. They also provide some capital, but ongoing operating costs for programs like this. Um, so between any capital assistance we might get locally and maybe through ODSA, uh, there still will be a gap. And so we will approach the faith-based community. The housing authority itself will kick in resources to the extent that we can. Um, and the, on the operating side, while grants are available, this is a local need, and so there will be a need for local dollars to continue to operate the shelter. Um, you should know, as I said two weeks ago, this is a very thorough and thoughtful process. Uh, we've involved experts. We've got key stakeholders involved in the process. Um, we're doing our very best to be as comprehensive in the planning as we can. Um, I open it up to questions. You, that, you? that was Bill. That was Bill. That was Bill. Me again. <laughs> ah, uh, I do it's have not a question. Me. So, uh, do you have an idea of what overall operating expenses would be uh, on an annual basis? No. Um, I, Knowing what our staff costs are to put our, our two full time, and we're going to add a manager to our emergency program, it's premature to, to put a number on that now, especially knowing that this will be probably 18 months to two years out. Um, there's this thing going on up right now called inflation, so it's really hard to peg numbers, um, and I'm, I'm loath to do that. Okay. Um, do you have an idea of where it's going to be located? And, and is the cost of the land being factored yeah, the into? Search results. Oh my God. <laughs> Thank you That's for answering you. that <laughs> question. I defer to um, Google or whoever might like be willing to respond. Um, wow. Oh my God. Okay. That is classic. Um, yeah. okay. uh, we have a couple of sites in mind. Land costs are partially in that $2.1 million number, so there would be some fungibility there. Um, but we don't want to get the cart in front of the horse on location. The beauty of that site plan and the building footprint is it is fungible, it is. Um, Malleable. It's an 8,100 square foot approximately pretty yeah. square yep. basic building. Yeah. So we could either build new, we could re we could reuse space if there's an adaptive reuse possibility. Um, ideally, the location will be determined uh, not just by its physical location, but also the cost that might be involved to either create or um, re reuse a property that's existing. Well, I think also the the uh, given the concept is that it has to have provide supportive services. The whole idea here is this is meant to be a temporary emergency purposes and at rapidly rehoused elsewhere. And but all of that uh, involves working with the family that is go going through this emergency situation. So it's making sure that we have access to, to resources, transportation, transit. Mm -hmm. It needs to be on the transit route. All those things have to be looked at uh, as well as even pedestrian access. Uh, uh, for employment as well as other supportive services for the family. So all that has to be taken into consideration in the site location. I know when the article first came out, we had, we had a realtor out in one of the townships that basically had property 5,000 square feet and said, hey, this would be perfect. No sidewalks, out in the middle of nowhere. Uh, sure, if you're going out there and retire, it'd be fine. But this is meant to be a temporary shelter for individuals so they can basically be rapidly rehoused elsewhere. So I think that that's all part of that location. Right. right. That's absolutely true. And it speaks to Commissioner Hudson's comment earlier, again, yeah. about collaboration. So Indeed. we've got great collaboration in this county. The yeah. design accommodates for those would be men, women, family. So we've got fungible space, again, that, uh, that concept, I think, will be, I think it's ideal. Yeah. yeah. So I, 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 but the reason we're moving this forward, uh, this, this quickly, uh, and making these commitments is, is, number one, we have a deadline for every two years we have the capital grant uh, process. And so we have to meet with that deadline in order to help secure some additional state funding. Uh, and I think, uh, uh, obviously, the commissioners also have the ability to dedicate ARPA funding. This is eligible as an ARPA expense. Uh, so we've got that, but it's going to take some time to work on that financial package. Yes. Uh, and, but at this point, we're looking for a commitment from us to be the, the, the fiscal agent, as we did for, were for the 100000 for the planning uh, for the grant that we uh, got received uh, through uh, Representative Ray and the operating budget. This uh, continues that effort. 
That's and right. we're asking for five hundred thousand uh, dollars, knowing that there's the ultimate commitment of trying to come up with about two point one million to construct the bricks and mortar of the of the project. The operating expenses, the operating program, that also has to be worked out in combination with our agencies and as you point out, nonprofits and the faith based community. So I'm uh, looking for your support that we go ahead and proceed uh, with the letter and, and ask for the. Uh, oh, absolutely. Okay. Super. Super. Oh. Right. Yeah, great. You. Great job, Skip. Great job. Yeah. All right. Okay. Um, start going down the list. Amy, do you have anything? Okay. Just a couple of things this morning. Uh, the first one is just to follow back up with you in terms of the uh, SPCA mm -hmm. donation. Um, I had uh, put together a summary of our past practices and what we've donated on an annual basis. And doing a little further research in the file, was able to come across the original letter that dates back to 2013 that characterized oops, a minimum donation for healthy owner surrendered or stray cats. So trying to balance what that offering or minimum donation was expected to be with the finances and some of the hardship we'd experienced last year with the delay in the collection of the late fees for the dog licenses and so forth. The recommendation I would put forth is that we, um, that you consider please a donation of $10,000 for this year to the SPCA. What did we do last year? Uh, last year was twenty thousand, and the year prior was ten. Okay. So this is based upon I, when I was with uh, Stephanie Moore, sitting down and negotiating uh, uh, the transferring of our we had a cat program, <laughs> right? Uh, that. And uh, <laughs> uh, moving it over, and the SBCA being willing to, and, and in that agreement that we would at least uh, at the minimum uh, provide that level of funding for that, rather than. Uh, I'm, I'm good. With that. I am too. Oh yeah. You know, and if we We're have a bang-up year, I can always approach you later and ask, that's right. you know, or recommend a second that's installment, right. but at least sure. to start the year, right. if we may do that. Okay. And, and, and I know under under legislation was passed last last year, we actually can use also general fund money rather than dog and kennel fund. We have that flexibility I thought we for could, their support. I thought we couldn't use dog funds like cats. Well, you can't, but that's why. <laughs> <laughs> but that's why it's a donation. Right. That's why it's a donation. <laughs> and and. Uh, Consideration was given to potentially restrict the donation and ask that right. they provide some kind of an accounting back in terms of the application of the full 10 towards cats. Right. Sure. So, okay. Yeah, I like your cat program. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and then just the second piece is we've been getting together as uh, department directors and working with Scott and working with Holly, trying to come up with ideas to um, encourage employees to fill some of the longstanding vacant positions that we've had, you know, in our, our different departments. Um, one of our directors, uh, Greg Brown, and I, and I were talking, and he's suggesting uh, consideration for a tuition reimbursement policy. Um, in his particular case, we've had trouble filling the open nursing positions, and if there's an opportunity that he can bring somebody in at an appropriately skilled level, but offer an opportunity for continued education, allow them to grow in their nursing capacity, um, it prompted that conversation. So we reached out to the other county um, administrators to get some sample tuition reimbursement policies and you know there's a variety of things that are common among all the different um, county tuition reimbursement policies you know some allow for full-time and part-time employees but by and large most of them are full-time employees eligible after pro probations completed successfully um, the courses would have to be approved in advance because you'd want the courses to improve job skills to their current position or some kind of an extension thereof for their future uh, employment uh, with the county. Uh, it, it, the coursework would have to occur during non-work hours. Um, there's a variety of different levels of reimbursement, but it's all the instructional fee. So some counties are 50%, 80%, 100%, but then they'll put a cap on what could be allowed per year. And then if someone were to resign or retire or be separated for a reason other than a job abolishment or layoff, there'd be a repayment back to the county. Um, and one, Fairfield County in particular, has a sliding scale. So if you were to leave within one year of completing that course where you were reimbursed for tuition, you'd pay back 100%. 
but then the next year it's 75, the next year it's 50. Mm -hmm. So I wanted to see if we had your support in preparing a draft Medina County tuition reimbursement policy for your consideration just to um, hopefully attract additional folks to open positions that we have and invest in those employees so that they can find some healthy and sustainable career mm -hmm. path you know, with us. I would definitely like to see a draft specifically in nursing. We're having a really, really hard time attracting nurses for the county home, so. I think it can apply to a, a number of different mm -hmm. jobs. I mean, even a lot of uh, fast food mm -hmm. companies, mm -hmm. uh, corporations are offering tuition reimbursement right. at some level. Yeah. So yeah. this is something that I think makes us competitive and with the difficulties in the employment market that everybody is having, mm -hmm. um, we need to do that. I think our investment ought to be in the people. Right. Mm -hmm. and I, I, I agree totally. When I'll, I'll echo back many, many moons ago when I was uh, employed in the private sector, they had a tuition reimbursement policy that helped me get a master's degree that then successfully mm -hmm. helped me further my career. So True. us, anything we can do to be somewhat competitive with the private sector, I think is also a bonus. Right. Indeed. So, so we'll draft something. For the draft. Okay. Everybody's Thank competing, you. same employees. That yeah. we are. So, right. Yeah. Okay. Thank right. you. Scott? Scott Miller? Good morning. Good morning, Good morning Scott. Uh, just a real quick update on the courthouse. Um, on the new section of the courthouse, we are down to the, uh, the details. We're talking about mill work now um, around doors. Um, talking about the, uh, we, fin we finalized the carpeting and, and, some, of the, and some of the interiors. Um, the final steel beam should be laid um, March 15th. Uh, that's the schedule for that. So uh, that is, is wrapping up. Um, we should finalize the AV for the courtrooms, um, hopefully this week. Um, we're going to an IP system, so it's going to be some additional cost um, from what was originally proposed. Uh, that will take us above the halfway mark on the $1.6 million contingency that we had. Um, so we're still doing really well. Um, the, they will be going through the 1841 courthouse um, this week and, and maybe next week. Um, kind of looking at those walls, as you know, there's been multiple additions, so we've got very thick uh, brick walls over there. So they're trying to determine, you know, what might be the best route for some of the, the uh, ductwork. Um, is some of the ductwork going to be reused or at least the, the same size as what's, what's being engineered? So uh, they're also looking at door hardware for 1841. So we're now moving really from the uh, new courthouse. Now we're, we're starting to move into 1841 courthouse to start working on some of those details. Um, the other thing I wanted to talk about is I know that uh, during budget hearings we've had um, some elected officials um, who have talked about wanting to get record scans and scanning records um, and hiring employees to do that. Um, so I would like to just propose the idea of maybe hiring uh, one or two individuals to scan for the entire county. So um, we can develop some kind of a records facility, I guess, and um, have that person there with scanners, and then elected officials, clerk of courts, the sheriff, um, the prosecutor, um, can bring records and, and, and start scanning. It would be beneficial because it would reduce the need for storage and re would reduce costs there. Um, it's also records are e more easily accessed if they're electronic. And I think it would also save costs because we'd only have a couple employees instead of each elected official. Have you talked to all the electives that scan? I've not talked to them yet. No, I wanted to propose the idea to you first. I do know that we have been approached by a couple, so I, I assume it would be beneficial to many. I spoke with uh, Rep. Rice Friday and met with him at his office. Mm -hmm. um, he indicated he has an entire room filled full of cabinets that uh, are nothing but paper files. And if he could get them scanned, he could redeploy that space to a more productive use. Um, you know, over the last two years, Forrest Thompson mm -hmm. has uh, asked for help with scanning. Mm -hmm. And um, like you said, the clerk of courts, um, there, there are a number of different areas that I think would benefit from a scanning operation. I would suggest that it be located in the IT area so uh, under Susan, mm -hmm. and um, and just have something that is available to everybody instead of having different electeds or departments going out and hiring people on their own. I, is it possible that the scanning equipment would be portable, that they could go into that area? Yes. 
So yeah. basically right. we we'll just go in there and do the scan so that way you're not moving <coughs> uh, documents that obviously like with the prosecutor, some of those have to be remain secure right. as yeah. well as the sheriff. The yeah. portable scanners are actually very common. Right. Yes, right. and, and high speed portable okay. scanner. So, so at this point, we're, um, we're helping provide the equipment and the individuals uh, on location to, to provide that. Right. Yeah, I, I think it's a good idea. Okay, great. I'll go ahead. And, and just uh, so you know, I know Rhonda made that recommendation a couple of weeks ago. So, hey, this would be a good idea. Mm -hmm. And if she's ready, it would be a good idea. So, uh, so I'll go ahead and, and put something together and, and, and present it to you. Well, at, at that point, we also come out like this with, with the work plan. Are we talking about two people? Are we talking about uh, and how much can they actually get done? Uh, that, that, it seems like yeah. it'd be a priority uh, kind of system. Yeah, in the, some the, ways. those are some of the questions that I need to get answered. Right. Yeah. I, I don't okay. know. I don't. I don't know. Yeah. We, we probably ought to survey all the county elected officials right. and, and develop a work you plan. Know, I mean, yeah. down in um, the yeah, office, they, they, they scan already themselves scan, and they have uh, documents down equipment, there. Yeah. You know, there there could be a, a much greater need than what we yeah. really expect. You may be right. Yeah. Okay. All right. Very All good. Right. Thank, Thank you. you. Thanks, Scott. All right. Well, let's see. Um, Holly, do you have anything? Stephen? All right. No, oh, he's going to want money. I'm always wanting money. I'm not sure how you guessed that one, but uh, uh -huh. we are um, installing the chiller and the boiler at our jail, and we are using ARPA funding for that. Um, process. However, a gardener is no longer allowed to use train equipment. We are a train facility out there. Um, however, um, it's got proprietary um, mm -hmm. software attached and they can no longer, they as a company can no longer adjust that software package. Mm -hmm. So they would like to adjust and we go to a non-proprietary system. They're offering us to put in a non-proprietary system at the jail that we can start implementing countywide uh, for $25,000 and that would be a change order to uh, the jail and the, or the chiller and the boiler at the jail. But we'll start implementing it through the county as we continue to move forward with this issue. So is there a, a for lack of a better term, a translator program that will interface with Train Trace so that we can manage the current train systems we have through this new we We'll service be looking into that um, so it's all back net kind of programming mm -hmm. um, and it'll drive back to certain pieces so as we yes we're gonna set the jail up all by itself and then we can actually bring the county home in because we're doing the county home mm -hmm. with that with their system and then as we upgrade systems we will drive it into the new non-proprietary system so we don't have this issue ever again with with using one style of system over another right it's more of a universal. So what are we what are we putting in the courthouse? What equipment is the train? It'll be back net. It is not. It is um, Johnson Control is going in as a um, system, mm -hmm. but I don't believe there are any control systems in that. So we'll hook it up to the new system that we're developing for uh, the jail. It'll be a, okay. like a web supervisor platform that will actually. So, so is the new system JCI or is that something else? The new system at uh, the jail is um, a Daikin system, and then the system going in at the courthouse is Johnson Controls, mm -hmm. and then we have trains and some Yorks throughout the rest of our county facilities. But as a as a command system, so as a as a intelligent platform where it's bringing in all that intelligence, um, that platform is going to be um, it's uh, a Niagara system. Uh, um, it, it's basically a non-proprietary system um, where any anything that's back net can come into it and we can read it and see it. So we should be able to move. We won't do it because of cost right away, but we can start moving our train system so the, the systems that are there, um, the web supervisor can understand. We can see them, but we're not going to do that right away. It would just be they're very costly getting all of our buildings all at the same time. Right. Right. We can do it over time and make it cost effective and, and make sure we're on the right so um, as next week, we would like to present a resolution for the $25,000 change order for um, the web supervisor's office. Yeah, I'll get to okay, that. I'm fine. Thank you. Thank you. Right. Thank you. Good. Thank you very much. You. Jeremy? Good morning, Jeremy. Good morning. Good morning. Again. 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 <laughs> um, so with over the last... Uh, 
couple of years um, was about the last time we reviewed our, our fees and charges, uh, which includes stuff uh, like our meter cost, um, some like our permit fees, and you know, with everything increasing in prices, um, I have a couple of copies here of what we would like to present. Um, just to kind of show where we're looking <coughs> to move some of our fees and charges, uh, this would be done through resolution, uh, hopefully next week. Um, there's not too much anything, uh, nothing crazy here. Um, one of the items I will bring to your attention is uh, our permits. Um, we, we had two separate fees for our permit, essentially uh, a new permit and then a repair permit. One was 75, one was 50. Basically, we're just going to call it a permit application fee and make it 50 bucks across the board. We want to encourage people to get per, uh, permits with us and not decentivize them by mm -hmm. making them too expensive. Um, and then, uh, yeah, as you can see, on the, the the price of meters have just gone up. Uh, copper has gone up. So this is just to kind of help us not lose money when we <laughs> do these uh, uh, water taps and, and, and purchase meters. And then this mm -hmm. is for consideration next week. Though. Correct. Correct. Okay. So if you, but if you have any questions on that, <coughs> feel free to reach out. And is, is there any way of posting this on our website or uh, putting it out there to make sure that the, uh, actually the, whether the public can actually see the, the proposed fees, if we can do that? Sure. Okay, sure. all right, yeah. thank you. I'm sure you, I think you have all types of documents of this from this morning, Rhonda. <laughs> right. Yes, yeah. I, I do. do. <laughs> okay. I do. Oh, very, very good. Uh, yeah, the um, <coughs> digital records, the flash drive, going to 10 to 20. It, is that what they're costing you now? We, we looked for a, at 128 gigabit or a gigabyte uh, flash drive was like $15. Okay. So <coughs> we reached out to e IT to get that, make sure okay. that that price was. Uh, All right. And then I'll say uh, one last thing. I just got a uh, <coughs> email from one of the properties at the Columbia Road, <coughs> excuse me, River Project. Mm -hmm. And I, it, it appears that he has a drone, so he has been flying his drone oh, periodically <laughs> to show different um, uh, pr progress of the of the job. So yeah. uh, I'll, I'll go ahead and forward that he had put him on a YouTube. Uh, oh, that's nice. So I'll cool. forward that over to you all so you can see. What nice. It's actually pretty good. <laughs> yeah. to be with you. So, but that's all I have. All, all right. right, great. All right, thanks, thanks for All right, hey, thank you. Thank you. All right. All right. Anything? Do you have anything else, Shannon? All right, Denise, anything? Uh, John, Burke, all right, Christine, anything? All right, cool, all right. There's uh, nothing else we do have, uh, or? Um, I, have I just have one thing. Um, yeah. There was a one Ohio Zoom meeting last week mm -hmm. um, where they rehashed everything that we've talked about for the last couple of months mm -hmm. and then decided that we ought to have the prosecutors come in and, and work on an agreement, which we That's talked what about we suggested that <laughs> from the very months. beginning. Yeah, okay. uh, and, and so they are, uh, they're going to start working on that. Okay. There, there was a suggestion that the, the local region be a nonprofit, similar to what the state um, that there's a number of nonprofit or non-governmental people. Right, it, right. right. Okay. And um, I, I'm not so sure that's a good idea. Uh, but we'll wait and see what they come up with. So, so this entity, the regional entity, will not ever have any money. Uh, it, it, the, it, they will just simply evaluate projects, proposals, and then refer them to the, the One Ohio uh, organization to, to consider funding them. So other than getting together and looking at projects and making recommendations, they really have no other function. Some so similar, uh, uh, Natural Resources Assistance Council through OPWC mm -hmm. is also, they never handle money, but all they do is they look at projects and then make a recommendation. recommendation. And, and, and so yeah, yeah. I'm not sure that a nonprofit structure is, is a needed. needed. Yeah. I, I think for two reasons, uh, public meetings and public records, Agreed. I would prefer that it be a public entity. I, I, I'd agree with that. I think that there is a hesitancy. I understand the uh, original attorneys were uh, trying to focus on making sure that it was much more broader than just uh, because the larger organization is a nonprofit that mm -hmm. the ones that are providing input likewise have that. I'm not sure <coughs> I agree with you. I think there's significant uh, public oversight ought to be at right. the local level. If there's recommendations coming from this region as to how the money ought to be spent, 
the public ought to, at that point, be able to have the opportunity to know that there's a public meeting and even have some input on, right. on those priorities, on those programs that are local. And, and, and understand what the recommendations are that are going to the uh, the larger organization. Uh, the other thing they talked about is is um, uh, starting to include all the county commissioners, um, so you guys would start getting all the emails about the meetings and about what's going on. I don't know if you have a preference or not. Um, you know, I I, I think in I, I think if they start expanding the group, it's going to get unwieldy. Um, so I'm fine my, with you, my, my suggestion would be is to have mm -hmm. one representative per county and, and, and then another representative or two for the townships and, and cities and I would, I would agree. Okay. I agree. All right. I will relay many, that back. How many counties do we have in that one, in that district? Uh, there's, uh, I think seven counties seven? Okay. and then, um, and then I don't know how many cities, villages, right. okay. townships, um, et cetera. Yeah. So. Well, as we know, in terms of the programming, uh, this is for opioid um, and substance abuse programs. Very few, uh, a town, obviously townships don't have programs. Uh, right. Most cities don't, uh, maybe the largest cities do, but largely it's county programs. So I think yeah. that it, uh, keeping it at the county level makes the most sense. I think so. So yeah. Okay, very good. Um, I just have one Go thing. Ahead. Today, Stephen was officially given our um, Time box for um, oh, cool. our courthouse project. I just want to thank a couple people. Brian, our own Brian, helped me gather much of the stuff, and all of the entities in our county are represented. And I'd also like to thank Brian and Carol Farron, the um, from the Medina Historical Society. They were instrumental in helping, uh, giving us great ideas for what should go in the box. So Super. that will be going to the construction people today, I believe. Super. And Brian's going to write up a little blurb about what's in the box. And so, so someone asked me, when will that be unearthed? When, <laughs> when the building comes yeah. down. When it's the building comes down. Okay. Yeah. yeah, long time. Yeah. <laughs> what I know easily, but it's like, <laughs> like who knows, right? None of us will be here. <laughs> <When that gets. laughs> so, okay. All right. Well, I, yeah. Well, I've got nothing, so uh, we do need a, a request for executive session. I will make a motion to go into executive session to consider the appointment of a public official. Second. Move and second. Roll call, please. Swedek? Yes. Hudson? Yes. Hambly? Yes. All right. Thank you very much. Uh, that'll do it for today. To to we'll come Jeremy back after the executive this. session yeah. to uh, adjourn. Make money Have a good day. Public records request.
It's 11-11. We have uh, uh, emerged from executive session. I do want to read into the record. Uh, we reviewed uh, section 5502.26 Countywide Emergency Management Agency description, as well as resolution number 90-39 pertaining to a resolution authorizing the formation of Medina County Wide Emergency uh, uh, Management Agency and sections that involve, we were in, intend on appointing to fill positions for uh, the Emergency Management Executive Committee uh, to composed of two Medina County Commissioners, one non-elected representative acceptable to the Board of Medina County Commissioners. And there's intent to appoint those positions next week. With that? I will make a motion to adjourn. Second. <laughs> Move and second. Any discussion? Roll call, please. Sweater? Yes. Hudson? Yes. Hamblin? Yes, and have a good week. <laughs>